Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Darsh Shah. And I'm Dr. Ultima Shraja. And welcome to Medicine Redefined. A podcast where we will explore the often overlooked but necessary components of health, what we consider to be the fundamentals. We will investigate topics and practices that can give you and your patients the best chance to optimize a healthy lifestyle. It's time to move the needle forward and put the health back in healthcare. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Darsh. And in this episode, we're going to go over artificial intelligence and its role in healthcare and medicine. It is one of the topics that has been most requested by our listeners, and we're finally getting to it. And we have definitely brought on a legitimate expert to really go deep in in terms of the topic. Now, obviously, over the last year, AI has just made such a boom. It's been talked about everywhere, not only in medicine and healthcare, but any field that you mention. It's being talked about on all sorts of podcasts, especially ChatGPT and just a lot of the newer companies and technologies that are now coming to the surface and really redefining the way that we live life and that we are going to live life. So our guest today is Joe Bakhti. He is the founder and CEO of QuantGene. His mission is to extend the healthy human lifespan by a decade, within a decade. So he has brought on a team of scientists and engineers uh, and he is dedicated to introducing the cloud AI precision diagnostics into a standard care to enhance the quality and accessibility of care for everyone to protect human life. He was born to scientist parents. He grew up with the backdrop of medical research before he earned a master's of economics from Germany. And he has held executive positions at BDDO and Omnicom uh, with a focus on business model innovation and technology. And then he went on to found I2X, which is an investment platform that provides qualitative analytics for biotech and technology portfolios. So as you can tell from the bio, Joe is somebody who really truly understands medicine at its core, but also the business development and the technology aspects behind it so that we can drive it. For those of you that listen to Peter Atia, you may have known that he mentions that we are moving from medicine 2.0 to 3.0. And in this 3.0, artificial intelligence is going to play a really big role. So in this episode, again, we go deep. We talk about things like, is AI going to replace doctors? Um, what type of capabilities will it have in the clinic or the operating room? What are the dangers? You know, What are the goals behind AI? Are we looking at robots and computers that patients will talk to? Or are we really just building technologies on the side to aid us humans? So we go into a lot of it. This is part one. So be sure we will come back with even more next week. But enjoy this episode for now. Let's get to it. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Super excited to have you here. I think that, you know, something that we've hinted at time and time again is just AI. And it's as we were talking about right before we started recording, it seems to be all the rage, particularly in medicine, because you might be familiar with this. I think Chat GPT recently was announced that they passed all three levels of the board examinations, the licensing examinations which um, is like one of the greatest stressors for us as they're going through our training. And so um, it is exciting at the, at the same time, somewhat um, demoralizing, I think, for a lot of people that, uh, that AI has been able to accomplish this. But I, I don't think anybody was surprised, right? Um, that, that that future that we've been talking about for decades now is, is finally here. So I suppose maybe a good place to start is for those who are listening and maybe live under a rock who don't who are not familiar with AI, open AI, chat GPT, that kind of stuff. What is artificial intelligence in, in that context? And, um, and really what got you interested in that field? Yeah, I think, well, that's a complicated question because we have a specific perspective on medical intelligence. That's how we call it. Um, of course I can go into technicalities that's less interesting. There are like, you know, deep learning models. There's like no machine learning, there's PyTorch. It doesn't matter. The, the bottom line is systems become intelligent when they're not hard coded that's how i describe it if you hard code a logic into a computer it's not intelligence it becomes intelligence when the computer or the system can learn and come up with stuff that you never told it to do and there are all kinds of ways of doing that recently we have huge breakthroughs with uh, large language models and also on the image imaging uh, image generation side um People in the know were not too surprised, but I think for most people who are not deep learning experts, it's just this inflection point, right? So for anyone in the industry it was clear three years ago, yeah, yeah, this is going to happen. 
But now people who just see ChatGPT4 or whatever you have, um, it's just completely shocking. And if you see what Microsoft just did, they connected all the Office uh, tools now with, it's crazy. I just saw that, I think yesterday. They connected all these Office tools with an AI that's not just ChatGPT, but also does certain things with the data. So it connects basically uh, their, what's the, the Dropbox thing that Microsoft has, like OneCloud, what is it? OneDrive. OneDrive. Um, with PowerPoint and Word and Excel, and that's nuts. Like we, it's the amazing thing is now we have this breakthrough and this is this exponential. Every week you have this shocking new thing coming out now, like the APIs of ChatGPT and so forth. When it comes to medicine, I just had a conversation with a finance expert, right, on financials. People in finance, lawyers, doctors. I always told everyone when you look at ChatGPT three. There was like 10, you know, the 10th percentile in the bar exam or something in, in law. And then chat GDB four is like 90th percentile. And it goes from like, oh yeah, being not good as not close to a human at all to the 10th percentile. Next version is 90th percentile. Next version, there's no human on earth anymore who can even remotely get as close as chat GDB five will be. And chat GDB five will be launched this year, probably unless Elon gets his way and stops it, but let's see about that. So I think we are in the middle of the hockey stick now. And that means all these professions will be massively changed in 24 months. And when I say massively, I mean massively. I think the idea that doctors are just getting removed from the equation is completely not happening, but you will definitely always need doctors, but it's a massive force multiplier, which means you probably need 1% of doctors who do a million times the work of the current doctors. And 99% of doctors have a problem because they are fundamentally not needed because the 1% that gets AI empowered can do the work of a million doctors each. So, and of course, most people will think I'm exaggerating, but I think I'm unfortunately not exaggerating. So I think that's literally what it is. Because imagine you can, you can diagnose, assess patients, you can do like a hundred per minute or something like that. And your error rate goes down dramatically. You still need meta systems that you design as a physician to review these things, but it's, you can write reports, you can bill insurance, whatever you need to do in milliseconds now. So it's, it's a big deal. And this is, you know, we have talked about this for so long. It's like self-driving cars. No one believes in it. And at the second it happens, it's totally game over, right? And this will happen in seconds, right? At some point, why is it suddenly here? Oh yeah, it will never make a mistake again, ever. And that's going to happen. I don't know when, but could happen any day now. So it's a very big, so I can't emphasize enough how big of a deal this whole situation is. And now it's out in the wild and it's like going exponential. Everyone connects their systems and it's going to be very interesting. So, you know, I, I had started this conversation with a ton of excitement and, and anxiousness because I was looking to the, to the brighter future as we can harness the power of AI to make medicine better, right? That's, that's kind of what the podcast is all about. But now I'm, I'm a bit terrified uh, <laughs> because you're telling me <laughs> the, the likelihood that I'm going to be in that 1% is very, very low. Well, it's, it's what, what's interesting is I wouldn't say it's very low because 1% of doctors still a lot of people and... Mm -hmm. The fact that you're doing the podcast already tells me you have a set of skills that makes you much more prone to be in the 1% because these skills, I mean, I love innovation and disruption. That's why I'm so excited. I'm not that scared because I think it's like being a child again with a level mm. of disruption like that, because who will be the people, who will be these super doctors? Well, number one, they need to know medicine. So you guys know medicine. That's good. That's your entry point. That gives you, then you're one of the hundred percent. But from there, everything you need for AI, besides just being decently smart, is completely new as a skill set. You don't need coding. You don't right. need any additional medicine. You don't know anything else other than having the curiosity of a child, because we're all children now, because, and we are children every week again, because at that speed of innovation, what you need to do to completely outperform anyone this week is go on Microsoft. I'm not paid by Microsoft. I just say I just said it. I saw it yesterday, and learn Office, the new Office from scratch. 
and empty your brain and say, forget everything you know, but this office thing now has what? And here's a little box and the box I can click on it. And suddenly it asks me any document you want to consider. You can click all it's like, what do you want me to do? Okay. Write up a summary and everything about patient so and so find the patient, my documents. And this thing will just do it. And, and then you can say, I like this. Can you turn it into a PowerPoint thing for the board? We, we discuss it like it's a tumor board or whatever. And it does it. You knowing that you can even do that knocks out every single competitor you might have as a physician. So, but how do you know that? What is required? Nothing. You just have to watch YouTube and do it and dabble around. And that will continue now every week because now Google comes up with something and then Microsoft comes up with the next version and then chat you. And this is going to happen every month or every week. And that's not going to end in the next three years. So I think that's the beauty of it. Like, I feel like a child again, because I, I have never seen any of these things. No one has ever seen any of these things. So, you know, and then in four weeks ago, it was all about ChatGPT 3 Now it's ChatGPT 4 and API. So it's like crazy. And each of these things is a total force multiplier of unlimited dimensions that you need to basically just dabble around. Do I click here or here? Do I say that? Does it do what I want? So I think this childlike curiosity with a good understanding what your objective is, that's why you need to be a doctor. That is what makes the one present. Yeah. Now, Joe, I'm going to take the opposite side. I'm pretty optimistic about AI. I mean, I find it very curious because, you know, I just read a book called Range by David Epstein, right? And his main focus is about being a generalist. And one of the issues with society, especially doctors, is that we love training. We keep going further and further and further into specialization to a point where we think we're so specialized that we can't be taken over until you have someone called AI maybe come in and do your job. And then it's tough to zoom back out and try to find another role. Right. I think, though, a lot of people, when they think of AI and medicine, their minds might be going to a bunch of different places. One might be diagnosis. Another might be writing and billing. Another might be even the emotional communication. From your perspective, where do you think at least the timeline is for AI to be incorporated in terms of medicine? Well, the timeline for that is now. Okay. That's for sure. So we already fully, like, we are scrambling to get ChatGB fully no one even knows what fully means, but we definitely use that every day. But we also a, a medical intelligence company pre chat GPT. So we also have a deeper uh, perspective on non chat GDP related intelligence, which is mostly how do you handle data? How do you create proprietary data sets and genomics? How do you handle that stuff and actually de derive new medical insights outside guidelines or pre guide like stuff that you have to invent? So that's going into the deeper frontier of science and medicine where ChatGPT can't do much because you need to design and devise new data capture systems that actually find out totally new things. Um, so, so that's not even medically related. I think every company, the same way every company needed to be a cloud company for a long time now, even though most companies still don't get it, but you need to be a cloud company and now you definitely need to be a AI company. Like now, like you have to basically train everyone in these AI tools and say every month you need to educate yourself what's going on and become really good. And I want to see everyone using that. So, you know, so that's con the confusing piece for me is that Quanchin was always an AI company. Only now that I have chat GPT and the whole craziness there, now we are a double AI company. So we have two different forms of intelligence that we need to consider and push. Yeah. So again, one of the things I think that, you know, in order to the potency and efficacy for AI is as we've alluded to a couple of times, is diagnostics, right? We've talked previously about all this nonsense that we have to kind of put into our mind just so we can pass a couple of tests and completely discard because as we get further and further into our training, it's just not relevant to what we need to do. And, you know, we need to look stuff up, we can Google, it does take some time, whereas AI can do it in a matter of microseconds, right? And then ultimately come to a pretty, pretty accurate diagnosis and probably a treatment plan too. the emotional connection discussion piece of it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm curious to see how we're going to evolve in that. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we're, we're going to be able to replicate that in the near future, but I certainly am excited to be wrong on that front as well. But I guess 
on the on the front of diagnostics, genomics is something that we've talked about at least offline or, or briefly touched on online as well. Can you talk more about your company Serenity, just genomics and bridge that into precision medicine in terms of how we can use that and how people are maybe even using that today, how you guys are using that? And then what does that mean to the average physician, average consumer, patient? Absolutely. So first to the emotional part, I just, uh, I forgot who that was, but someone just talked to someone. They said they did a test on this and it was very shocking. Basically, ChatGPT does a much better job than most physicians would do emotionally. So nice. you basically, if you tell ChatGPT, okay, here's a new diagnosis, it's a mom and it's a kid, and uh, please have a conversation with a kid about, you know, how to explain this, they were like blown away. So I would be very, very hmm. cautious making these, like sometimes it's shocking how much better it's actually in fiction or in emotional stuff or poems and stuff, and you're just completely blown away. So I don't think that's lagging a lot. That's actually very interesting. Interesting. But on, you can test it out, just give it a tough case and say, how would, how would you explain this to the children or, and you will be probably shocked. So Quantine, so our, the company is Quantine and Serenity is a product we are launching. Quantine is a deep genomics company. So we do very advanced human genomics from standard, you know, whole exome sequencing, pharmacogenomics, where we connect medication issues to your genes to just basic genetic risk factors for diseases and what that means for your risk profile and what that means for your preventative care strategies um, to very new platforms where Quantine is one of the leaders in the space. The one most important being uh, liquid biopsy. So that is a blood-based multi-cancer detection technology, we take three blood samples, 30 milliliters, extract from the plasma, your cell free DNA, DNA outside cells from cells that have died, that includes potential tumor cells, or tumor DNA, we then sequence it with single molecule precision, which is a new thing, we can actually investigate every single molecule of DNA at certain targets, identify how many targets carry a cancer variant, tumor associated mutations then run it against an AI model that we trained with our own clinical data, which is a simple model, by the way, it's more about the data than the model. Um, and then detect cancer's early stage. And of course it's a total game changer because with a simple blood draw, you can now detect basically all cancer types, except for glioblastoma um, at early stages in the blood. And by doing early detection, that's what most people are not fully aware of. If you have, we just had a case, super healthy person, you know, mid, like mid forties was, we detected our, our, one of our systems detected kidney cancer, early stage, totally shocking, like out of the blue, early stage kidney cancer, got a resection, like uh, kidney removed, was back in the job one month later, cancer free. If we wouldn't have detected that cancer, you can look up what it means, right? Late stage, like if you have kidney cancer symptoms, meaning stage four, maybe stage three, maybe most likely stage four, you have a problem. Like your survival rate is under 10%. So you go from 98% survival, long-term survival to under 10% five-year survival. So it's like dramatic, same person, same cancer, if we would not have detected that one year later, or no one can exactly predict, but one to two years later, very little chance of survival. And what that means is by having these new precision medicine, AI enabled, but also it's not just AI, it's genomics plus AI, imaging plus AI, we combine these in the Serenity product. By doing that, I am convinced, I don't have the data yet for specifically Serenity to prove it. We need more patients for that, but I'm convinced we already defeated cancer with Serenity. I'm convinced if you do Serenity once a year, your chances of dying of cancer have been reduced by at least 80% over your lifetime. And I stand with this statement. I know physicians will go a little mad on me. It's like, how can you even say that? But there is a lot of evidence surrounding full body MRIs and AI enabled plus genomics in conjunction with each other 
plus knocking out all KR gaps. That's part of us. We also see all your standard screenings and what's late. We have a big data intake. So big data, preventative care data to just adhere to guidelines, plus deep genomics, plus complete imaging in conjunction in a single product for under $5,000 a year. Still expensive, but affordable for a lot of people. In my opinion, you will see that we knock down cancer deaths by 80% in that population that adheres to that once a year. And that means we knocked out cancer as a top 10 cause of death. So that's also like something people have to get aware. I think we are already in a period where we have technologies to eliminate cancer from the top 10 list. Wow. I mean, it's, it's pretty exciting to hear, right? Just think about how much cancer really derails a lot of people's lives, a lot of people's livelihood. I am curious though, when you say deep genomics, right? It makes me think of deep learning and I'm assuming you're kind of meaning it in that same sense. For the listeners who might not understand those that, that terminology, right? When they think about your company and you talk about getting blood work and put it, uh, pitting it against uh, your AI model, can you just explain briefly, maybe, you know, if you're explaining it to like a fifth grader, what exactly does it mean to use AI within your company? So with deep, I actually don't mean AI in this case. Oh, okay. I just mean literally, literally deep. Okay. But it's really <laughs> because it's um, when you think of AI, there's always like, I don't know who said that Sam Altman or something, how they think around it. It's like three pieces of the equation, data, algorithms, and compute power, right? That's the three pieces of in innovation that drive the engineering of AI. And there's always debate. Is it the algorithms? In the 60s, I thought it's all about algorithms. Like who has the magic algorithm that makes it work? Today, we know the algorithms are half trivial. It's always the same thing you're doing. So it's more about the architecture of data and algorithms plus compute power. You need massive compute power and you need massive data. So it's still a triangle, but data becomes more and more important and compute power. So you can have basically the same deep learning model, but if you have a trillion data points and the other person has 10, you're just going to win. Even if the other person has a hundred times more powerful algorithm, which doesn't help. So in genomics, deep means Okay, fifth grader. How do I explain it? <laughs> so it's very kind of simple. If you look at your healthy genome, that's what normal geno genetics is. You have 30 trillion cells. We want to know, okay, Dash, who are you genetics wise? We take your cells and we start sequencing your cells. Like we have an instrument, like a machine, like a hardware chemistry machine that reads out your genome. And the question is, how often do we have to read out how many genomes in order to get an answer? And the answer is roughly, it's called the sequencing coverage. How often do you have to look at each point statistically? The answer is 100x. So you look 100 times at your stuff. Why? Because it's complicated, it's distributed. We want to make sure we capture each piece at least 20 times because you have these two chromosomes and two alleles, so mom and dad. So if you capture something 20 times and there's 50% elite frequency, you see it 10 times, right? Because it comes from only one part and the other part is different. That gives you enough resolution because if you only see it twice, you could be wrong. So, well, we need to see it 10 times. When we do cancer detection, why it's deep, you have a whole different problem. That's why it took so long to develop these things. We sequence at a depth of, you know, 25,000 to 50,000 X instead of 100 because what we just did with your healthy three trillion cell average with a hundred. Now we have to look at the little DNA fragments and make sure if I take a thousand fragments from a thousand DNAs and one stems from a tumor cell and 999 do not stem from a tumor cell because it's needle in a haystack problem in your blood. It might be just one in a thousand. I find that. And statistically, then you don't have to look a hundred times. If you have a thousand pieces, you want to find one, you can't look a hundred times. You need to look actually 25,000, 50,000 times. And you can imagine what that does to costs. It's like a linear increase in cost. So that's the problem. And technological challenges all over the place because you have error rates. And... So that's why we call it deep. You have basically imagine a stack of DNA. Now you have a deep stack, like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, and you need to investigate every single piece and find the one in one or 2000 that carries a different variant than all the others. And that requires super ultra deep sequencing 
and you deep you take a deep dive into the DNA structure in your blood as opposed to normal genetics. Got it. Thank you so much for that. And then, yeah. because then you get massive amounts of data and then the AI has to deal with the data. So it's kind of indirect. Absolutely. So you're dealing with accuracy and speed as well, right? That's the, the name of the game, especially for you as a CEO, right? If you're trying to beat everyone else in the market and whatnot. So it makes a lot of sense. Thank and I can you. tell you just as, a, just as a rule of thumb, why can we detect all these cancers early stage in the blood now was, or traces of these cancer signals? Well, if we do one sample, a single sample that we sequence, we get 10 billion data points. Like each patient delivers 10 billion unique letter reads, like DNA reads, nucleotide reads. So that's very different from a PSA test. Like if you do a PSA test, you literally get one data point, the number. We get 10 billion and you need to feed it into it be gigabytes of data. You feed it into our Amazon cloud. There's a huge bioinformatics pipeline. They have to read out every single letter, align it to the human genome compare, overlap, map, mm -hmm. read out, filter out errors. So it's like a bigger operation. Wow. Okay. So I want to take it back to Serenity. So you did mention cancers, liquid biopsies. What else can genomics do for us currently? So it can do a lot of things. So number one, cancer detection. That's, I think, where most people are the most excited. Number two, something very different. It can read your genetics understand your genome, understand, basically you imagine you find a lot of variants on your genome that makes you different from other humans, and then map these variants to a database that understands the associated medical risks. So, oh, you have that variant that is found to elevate your lung cancer risk 8x, just statistically. That is very important. So we can build these risk profiles. And that's changes the standard of care because in standard of care the screenings we have the preventative screenings we recommend to the population are normally very low resolution they say you're dash you're male you're at this age now you need a fit test a year or every 10 years a colonoscopy and you need like every two years an annual physical or something once you run the genetics and some other things you figure out well you're not just that age and male you're much more. You have a very, you have an eight X higher risk for that, but a two X lower risk of that. Therefore you shouldn't get every year this, you should only get it every two years, but you should get this thing every six months. And as you can imagine, that's very, very important because that changes the equation of risk and preventative care. And that has a direct impact on your death risk, mortality risk. So basically it's, it's like you want to, the future of genetics that is here now allows us to create much higher accuracy risk profiles and much, much better preventative protection, much better. And it's more magic now we can basically see, oh, Dash, we ping you with a text message like it's time in three months, you should schedule ABC, done. So from your perspective, it's like, oh, that was easy. But what's behind that is a whole crazy situation where we kind of assess all these risks. We tie it into guidelines. We know there's a guideline for high risk colon cancer candidates that maybe it changes the screening frequency and the screening type and the downstream, you know, confirmatory diagnostic. So there's a lot of complicated stuff that you don't need to know. You just need to know we have a high precision profile of your risk and we make sure we are knocking out these risks very systematically. With a text message, we just say, it's time to do this. Done. Love that. There's a ton of stuff that I want to follow up on. I'll start by, you know, asking, I think, are there diff any types of cancer that this type of screening, genomics-based screening cannot identify in terms of your DNA? So in theory, the answer is no because every cancer carries some form of mutation, somatic variants on the mm -hmm. genome, otherwise it wouldn't behave like cancer. In reality, there are two caveats. Number one, we are early, right? So for example, quantine has limited data on certain cancers. Theoretically, we can kind of guarantee we detect them, but we cannot tell you at one sensitivity and specificity because we have insufficient samples. So, and since there are 50 different cancer types, it's gonna take a while before you have them on all types. But Theoretically, you can already argue we are going to find them all. Then there's glioblastoma, which is a little different. 
brain cancer because there's a blood brain barrier and there's a huge filtering going on with selfie DNA from, you know, any kind of liquid that's on the other side of the barrier. So we probably can detect it. There's actually some liquid biopsy studies that show we can detect real restoma in the blood, but it's going to be, my gut feeling is at a much significantly reduced rate. Then there are other cancers like leukemia. Funnily enough, leukemia, which is like, should be easily detected in the blood. It's actually very hard to detect because the mutational profile of leukemia is very problematic. So leukemia is very heterogeneous in terms of if you take a hundred leukemia patients and see what mutations they have, they're all over the place. It's very inconsistent. They are very heavy on TP53, which is a tumor suppressor gene. And that's always bad news because it's like spread out. So it's much harder to detect the signal for leukemia. For example, pancreatic cancer or colon cancer, very KRAS heavy. And KRAS is such a strong, it's a very limited number of mutations on KRAS that change the RAS protein and the RAS pathway. And so it's like a handful of mutations that occur in 90% of pancreatic cancer patients. So that makes it a much stronger, clearer signal. Whereas in leukemia, it's just a mess, right? And then you get a mess. And some people have also messy mutations on TP53 who don't have tumors. So leukemia is also a tough one. So you mentioned earlier imaging that in conjunction with this type of data and this type of information can be powerful, right? It can, it can strengthen the, the, the signal, if you will. What yes. other than whole body MRIs, other imaging modalities that you guys routinely use? So that the fundamental logic behind why we are doing it, number one is um, if you have a signal from liquid biopsy, from genomics, like this deep genomic signal, there's always the same issue in medicine. How do you know it's not a false positive? At what point are you confident? And sometimes these signals can be very thin. Like there is a signal we found basically two mutations, like literally two molecules. Okay, what do you do? You can run it against the control sample and see, well, it looks like no one ever had that many as a control, but still just two. So we are a little not confident, should we follow up with something or not? Now, let's say these two are associated with potentially liver and kidney cancer, right? Statistically, like there would be most likely either liver or kidney, what we found. Okay, if you then do imaging full body MRI and you don't see anything in the kidney or liver, they would say like, well, oh, there's one tiny little signal in genomics, maybe not enough to actually go downstream. Let's just wait and do it again in six months. If the imaging comes back and in the kidney, you see a tiny lesion where the radiology says, uh, radiologist say, says, well, I wouldn't do anything because could be kidney cancer, but the odds are like under 1%, could be just a fatty lesion. Then you combine the two and say like, well, but what are the odds that you found a tiny little genomic kidney cancer signal and, and a tiny imaging kidney cancer signal of all the organ systems and all these millions of mutations, you found these two that just coincide exactly with one organ you have a totally different signal strength. Mm -hmm. So there's a squared correlation, geometric correlation. If you have orthogonal signals, they are completely orthogonal. They are completely independent signals, right? A lesion in the kidney on imaging has nothing to do with genomics. Like there's no way that this is correlated if it's missing. Well, not likely. So that's why we love these two completely independent angles. And no one has ever done that, by the way. So Serenity is the first system that really combines two cutting edge systems. To your question, we don't, unless you are a smoker and you need CT scans on standard of care, we don't combine it with any other imaging ex ante, like before we know anything, because it's an agnostic screening, it's for healthy people. And you want to basically have a broad insight. And if you don't find anything, don't do more stuff. Now, if you find something that requires downstream specific organ specific screenings, then you are off to the races, right? You can say, well, we need like whatever you need. It can be targeted MRI, can be targeted CT, can be all kinds of stuff. That is a, a that depends what you find and what the guidelines are. Got it. Yeah, no, the orthogonal signal thing makes sense to me, right? It just creates a nice little X for you, X marks the spot, and then you're you're much more likely to to hit that bullseye at least from a detection standpoint, and then maybe early intervention um, when appropriate. Um, you know, one thing I realized we forgot to ask is you mentioned Serenity hasn't been officially rolled out yet. Is that correct? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we are now in the middle. Well, we are, we wanted to do a stealth launch, but now we're just rolling into this whole thing because people start to use it and the word starts to spread. So we get people in. Got so, it. but yeah, we want to, we are still preparing. I think our website and marketing could be a little stronger before we do hmm. like a big bang thing. But here in LA and Miami, we are already having people going through it and we can already tell they're telling other people and which is good for us. So we didn't pull the real PR trigger yet because that's just a marketing thing. We want to be sure the website yeah. is like clean, but the system is fully up and running. Patient goes through it and we get very, very strong. Yeah. Positive feedback. So pardon my ignorance on this, but have other similar systems, genomics based testing been around in the States Are other people utilizing this type of technology to, for early detection? So no one brought it together in a product you can just buy and combine that and get a report that incorporates big data, genomics and imaging in a singular report to actually mm. be safe. But there are other people like Grail, for example, that sell right. it in the privacy gallery. I mean, I have my opinions on it. I don't want to say too much. I don't, I think there are other systems I'm more impressed by than Grail because Grail sure. is stuff I don't understand. And normally in genomics, that's not because I'm dumb or don't know stuff <laughs> just don't totally understand how this works so um they're also in big i think trouble on a corporate level right because they they were bought by illumina for reasons no one really understands and then illumina got trashed the stock by the capital markets because they didn't understand it now today actually today it's an interesting day the ftc ruled that actually the merger is not approved so the merger was not approved in the US. It was approved in the US and not in the European Union. And now suddenly it's not approved in the US either. So they reversed their decision, which is very bad for Grail because they probably have to get kicked out of Illumina now. I don't want to speculate too much, but based on how much money they raise and how they burn and that they don't make much, I don't understand exactly how they, they would survive outside Illumina. So there is a whole problem there. Um, and I'm not just bashing them. I think there are other people who are not live, who actually had strong signs and interesting stuff. Freenome mm -hmm. is an interesting example. They're working on that. And I think they have a great team, uh, Thrive at Exact Sciences. They were bought by them. They have very similar technology to ours or had in the past. Now we are more updated, but maybe they also updated it. So uh, this is definitely coming, but if Grail goes away, Quantum would be the only, or Serenity is the only system live, but that could change over the next 12 months. Gotcha. Well, Joe, as we've started talking about this and just learning more about AI genomics, you know, I think both Darsh and I have realized there's no possible way we can do this topic's uh, service and our audience justice by wrapping this up in the next couple of minutes. And I know you have to go. So if you'll agree, uh, I certainly think we're going to need a part two, just so we can dive a little bit deeper into how it's going to continue to develop. Absolutely. Um, but before I let you go, I do want have uh, two more questions. I think one of the things that comes to me and, and concerns me, you know, understanding the healthcare model in this country, at least, right, where, where we're practicing, Darsh and I in the States, um, the concerns that people have when we have this type of advanced testing and, and risk stratification that we're talking about, early detection, um, really just deep, deep um, knowledge that people can gain. It, it can certainly be powerful, right? And it can be actionable, but it can also create an opportunity for unnecessary testing, unnecessary anxiety, and for lack of a better word, harm. I suppose this is something that's been brought up to you more than once as you've developed this out and, and brought it to multiple providers and these concerns have been raised. How do you address that? Do you have thoughts? And I'd just be curious to get those. So there's a, we definitely need a part two for that. And I think that's a very important topic. Like now we got the tech down, we understand the potential. Now what is happening when you actually do this? Mm. And the challenge in healthcare is that, and, and we kind of innovated this whole problem and addressed it in a very new way with Serenity. So when you look at Serenity, this is not a liquid biopsy test. Serenity is a service to keep you and your family safe from harm. 
So why did we not sell it as a liquid biopsy test? Because we said the test alone is not gonna, it's gonna potentially create much more harm than good. Same with a full body MRI, same with comprehensive medical data. If you just take in the old system of medicine, everyone was very specialized to your point in the beginning. That's also true for vendors. If you were a diagnostics lab or genomics lab, you dropped the ball right after delivering the test result to a doctor, not even a patient. Like here's your result, bye. And then the doctor says, okay, what do I do now with this? What we realize is things have become so complicated and so much upside in integrating this, you cannot do this anymore. We believe in vertically and horizontally integrated medical systems. So if you provide genomics, you should also provide imaging. You should also provide medical intelligence. You also provide primary care physician advisory with primary care docs who are trained on the whole system. You also budget out the time you need with the patient. You also consider how long consultations need to be. And you also consider what the downstream care coordination has to look like. Because if you don't, you have a super powerful tool, you put in the wrong hands of the wrong physician. This physician doesn't understand what it means. And it has only two minutes with the patient because that's how they're scheduled. And then you have a giant mess. So the question of anxiety, even false positives, but specifically downstream harm from false positives. These are not fixed variables. That's the big mistake of the current system to say, what is the false positive rate and the harm rate of your test? In my opinion, in the future, that's a dumb question because the answer is we don't know. It depends what you are going to do with it. And in other words, for a patient, don't just buy one test and give it to a random physician. Buy solutions that keep you safe, where whoever provides a solution is accountable for the entire outcome and manages everything because the physician needs to be integrated with the test. The downstream coordinator needs to be integrated with the physician. The medical intelligence portal needs to feed the physician based on the clinical data. And only if you do it all together, can you achieve great results? That's a very new system because that's why Serenity is self-payer right now or executive health because we don't want just to sell liquid biopsy multi-cancer detection into some wild Kaiser Permanente thing. And then you have no idea what they do with it. And we look bad because they might have a lot of false positives because they read it wrong. I'm not bashing Kaiser. I'm just taking this as a non-integrated system to us. So that is the future of medicine. You need to own the outcome and to own the outcomes like Tesla or the iPhone. Right? Apple cannot say, well, it's not my problem. I produced a chip and gave it to the phone guy. And then the phone guy messed the chip up. Not my fault. <laughs> it's like, no, they, they own the iPhone. Say, if the iPhone doesn't work, it's our fault. We cannot say Intel's fault. Well, Tesla, they cannot say, well, you ordered a Tesla, but you know, bad luck, you know, the battery people messed it up. It's like, no, like you ordered the Tesla, you get a Tesla. So the same should be true in medicine, but it's not right now. That's why we invented Serenity. So it becomes true. I love that. I mean, it's a, it's a whole systemic mindset perspective change. It's a steep uphill battle, uh, Joe. Um, I, I love uh, the idea behind it. Uh, certainly want to explore this further with you. Um, we want to be respectful of your time. I know you, you have to kind of jump off, but um, we'll table this and, and come back to uh, hopefully somewhere in the near future when our schedules align. But um, any parting words that you want to leave our listeners with, our audience with, any uh, pressing things that come to your mind that, that you think is worth including here? I think that last topic is super important, should be part of part two. What actually does it mean for you as a patient and how do we build the future of medicine? My advice to patients is when we look at healthcare and talk to other people, vendors, systems, technology doctors, the excuse is always the same. They say patients don't want to pay for healthcare themselves. Therefore, the insurance has to pay. Therefore, everyone's going to get sick and die because we can't control that craziness. Because they're going to say, oh, we can't pay for this, go here, and now not that, and now you're screwed. And no one can build holistic systems. My advice is if your health is important to you, you need to wrap your head around the fact that you need to pay yourself because then you become the boss and you pick and choose what is good. Number one, pay yourself. And number two, then you are the boss and seize control of it and really try to understand what people are trying to sell you. That's how you make a giant leap in personal protection. 
Love it. Awesome. Until part two. Thanks, Joe. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you found that episode as fascinating as I did. You know, I was very pro AI and Joe has really helped shape my framework even more about it. When, especially when I talk to uh, my colleagues about the future of medicine, um, you know, it's not necessarily black or white. There is a lot of gray area, but having an expert like Joe come on can really just elucidate those loopholes and those things that we weren't really thinking about um, that maybe we should. So. The future looks promising and next week is even more promising because we'll have Joe back again for part two. Um, As always, our medical disclaimer, everything in this podcast is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine and we are not providing medical advice. No physician patient relationship is formed and anything discussed in this podcast does not represent the views of our employers. We recommend that you seek the guidance of your personal physician regarding any specific health related issues. And thank you to our team. Ethan Ju and Haritha Yepori for the production of this podcast. And we'll see you next week as we talk more AI.